мисля, че е време да представя първият ни гост. Робин Андриус е доктор по вълканология и е журналист на свободна практика. Негови статии са били публикувани в водещи издания по света, включително National Geographic, Forbes, Atlas Obscura, The Verge, Scientific American. И той е тук, за да ни поговори малко за чудесата в Слънчевата система. Робин, аплодисменти за Робин Андриус. Nice to know so many people want to hear about your tone it's going to take, by the way, so just to warn you in advance. So I used to um, blow stuff up for science, not money, so it's fine. Uh, I wanted to know how volcanoes work, so I kind of buried explosives in the desert and blow them up. And uh, it turns out the explosive residue gets on your clothes and you can't wash it off. So when you go through airport security and they go, can we just scan you for you know, any dangerous material, and you're like, fine, and then it goes, where and people approach you with guns. It's uh, awkward, because <laughs> then they say, sir, have you been using explosive recently? And if you say um, yes, then you die, and if you say no, then you know, they know you're lying. So it just came out as yes, which <laughs> is the wrong answer. So that proved too stressful, so I became a science journalist instead, and a poser. Here's me posing on Mount Fuji like an idiot. Um, <laughs> it's a volcano. It's very, very cool. You should see it. Um, but I write about all kinds of things, really. I want to talk about my favorite things uh, here. Um, you've got earthquakes that lasted forever, th tectonic plates that broke into, uh, hidden meteorites, lots of explosions. Um, so <sighs> this all really starts with a very strange story about the moon. Now, everyone sees the moon. It's very familiar. It's that lovely thing in the sky that gives us tides. Um, so Obviously, we all know that people landed on the moon. If anyone denies that, just get in the sea right now. Uh, <laughs> the Sea of Tranquility and all the other seas are named after, you know, well, sailors thought they used to be oceans on the moon. They weren't far off. They're actually frozen oceans of magma, which is pretty cool. So we landed in a, um, you know, humanity has landed in a frozen magma ocean several times, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, the moon is also like a light bulb. It's electric around the outside. So when, you, when there's an eclipse, um, some electronic shenanigans happen where it actually kind of fizzes and glows around the outside. So I think that's kind of cool that the moon's like an electric light bulb. But in the 50s, it was a different time, uh, there was a report going around I love this story. There's a report going around that the Soviets were going to detonate a nuclear bomb on the moon to be, you know, show off and show what their absolute scientific prowess could do. Uh, and uh, it, the, the reports came out and, you know, the Americans were like, oh, this is ridiculous. You can't detonate a nuke on the moon. Stupid. It's really stupid. But in secret, they were like, we need to detonate a nuke on the moon. Let's get work on it. Let's work on it. <laughs> so they actually, they actually got lots of scientists together and said, can we detonate a nuke on the moon? And they were like, why, yes, why not? You know, the, the motivation for this is obvious. I mean, scientific, political, military. And then they went through the report and they went, might look a bit bad. <laughs> we might be interplanetary graffiti artists. Like maybe we should not nuke the moon. Um, and turns out that they didn't nuke the moon and we landed there instead. But imagine if we nuked the moon just to show off. But it kind of reminds me that throughout history, science in general, whether it's what I'm talking about or any other science, is in kind of deep trouble. The perception of it is very strange. So this is an example a couple of years ago. There was a big survey and it turns out <laughs> The Americans are more afraid of clowns than climate change. I'm hoping that has changed now. But there was a big survey, and yes, they're more afraid of clowns and terrorism, economic collapse, and dying, which is <laughs> absolutely, oh, God, it's hilarious. It's, absolutely, it's mental. Anyway, that's crazy. And then they went further in this survey. This is on a website called Vox, and they said, so what would you want the government to do about these clowns? And two out of three said, we want them to do more to stop the clowns, more to stop the clowns. Um, and then, uh, you know, 36% said they want the FBI to do something about clowns. <laughs> Go get them in a net or something, they're everywhere. But my favorite is just that 25% said they just keep doing whatever you're doing, it's great. <laughs> the FBI is doing nothing about clowns, <laughs> just in case you're wondering. <laughs> and, you know, if you ever feel like, you know, oh, I don't really know much about science or, you know, you feel like similarly worried about such things, just go to Google, go on an anonymous browser and type in a few words, and you can see the most common answers for certain questions, like, what does gravity give us? Or the ability to stay on the goddamn planet, which is <laughs> really useful, <laughs> last time I checked. What is the largest planet in the world? Oh, my brain, <laughs> it aches. 
and any of these, when will Pluto and any of that bollocks? <laughs> Absolutely terrible. Um, so, you know, and obviously, like, this kind of perception of people not knowing much about science or planetary science comes into a lot. So there was the great American eclipse a couple of years ago. It was very extraordinary. Scientists said, please do not look at the eclipse. It could damage your eyes. So everyone, like, paid attention. Every single person uh, looked at the eclipse. <laughs> And of course he did. There was actually a bodyguard at the bottom going, don't do it! <laughs> and he did it twice. It was crazy. But it wasn't just this person. Actually, some people were found putting sunscreen in their eyes. <sighs> don't really need to add to that. Uh, and a really a, a Google, popular Google search after the eclipse was, I looked at the sun and my head hurt. So, <laughs> so when, you, when it comes to talking about planetary science and things like that, there's a very low bar. <laughs> um, but... I feel like, you know, when you're at school, you're taught, like, here are the planets, these are these things, blah, 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 and that's kind of it. But if you learn about the really cool, weird stuff that was going on, I think people might have a little bit more trust in the scientific method. Like, did you know, for example, that we recently shot an asteroid? We shot it twice. Like, not because it did anything mean to us, but we wanted to get a sample. So this is uh, the Hayabusa 2 mission. Uh, it's going to an asteroid, Ryugu. It went down to the surface and fired a bolt to gather all the little dust bits that came up. We shot an asteroid. That's ridiculous. Um, if you're wondering, though, uh, we actually can't blow up asteroids with nuclear weapons or anything. Armageddon and all that is just, unfortunately, not possible. So, sorry, Bruce Willis. But here's a simulation of what happens if you try and blow up a big enough asteroid. So it looks like, yes, we did it. Oh, it blew apart. Oh, oh, no. Oh, God. What's it doing? Oh, it's reforming. Oh, God. Basically, asteroids are like the liquid terminator. You know, it reforms. Um, that is terrifying. <laughs> so, yeah, it reassembles itself, and, yeah, so the best thing is to actually, like, nudge them out of the way. Uh, speaking of asteroids, everyone knows an asteroid kind of finished off the age of the dinosaurs. What people don't know is that when it hit, which is on the far left of this thing, it actually sent material right up into space, created a tsunami that went around the world. But some of that material was probably sent as far as not just our moon, but the moons of Jupiter and Saturn. So there might be fragments of dinosaur on the moons of Jupiter and Saturn which is mental. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. Um, future archaeologists would be really confused. Um, <laughs> but yeah, the tsunami was pretty awful. I mean, it hit here. It went around the world in about a day. Um, it, would, it is bad. <laughs> Asteroids are bad. We can all agree on that. Um, and uh, yeah, if you've, it's not the matter of just getting wet in a tsunami. It will just wipe everything out. So it was a very bad day for the dinosaurs. But I really write about volcanoes. I talk about volcanoes. This is Stromboli in Italy. You really should go there to see it. It's like standing in front of a dragon or something. It erupts like this every two hours or so, although awkwardly every now and then it does blow up and uh, do, do a bit of killing and it's a bit annoying. So just, you know, get your timing a bit right and you'll be fine. But there are space volcanoes, for God's sake. How is this not taught in school? There are volcanoes on the moon of Jupiter called Io that fire lava into space. I can't think of a better image to get people interested in science than, look, look at it. That's, that's the, from the Voyager Pro. It's, they saw lava fountaining into space. And the volcanoes on here were actually powered by tides. So on Earth, the moon causes the tides in the ocean. With Jupiter's massive gravitational well and the moons going around Io, the gravity actually put, causes tides in the solid rock and rips it apart and actually causes eruptions by literally tearing it apart, just like you know, tides. It's, it's tidal volcanism. It's very strange. And the eruptions on here are so bright, you can see them from Earth. But if you went onto the surface of this moon, you'd freeze to death because there's no atmosphere. So it's a place where hell literally freezes over. It's ridiculous. Um, I love Io. Um, and people are <laughs> asking me, like, so how high, is that? How, how high does that go? And I... I often like chat to my like, younger family members to be like, I, you know, what's the best way of estimating the height of these things? And they went, try about mountains. So it's, it's 45 Mount Everest high, this eruption. But they're like, it's not good enough. So it's 127 Golden Gate bridges stacked end to end. That's how high it is. Uh, or 67,000 great white sharks. <laughs> or if you want 1.3 million lightsaber wielding kittens, which I've never been able to get into an article for some reason. Um, and then there's Saturn's rings. Saturn's rings are absolutely amazing. I don't think anyone has said Saturn's rings are shit or anything like that. They are absolutely gorgeous. And here's uh, a moon called Enceladus. Uh, it has ice volcanoes somehow in it. Um, no one knows what's powering them, but it's, 
it's crapping out ice <laughs> into space from its south pole, and it's actually cleaning the rings, which is very nice. Um, <laughs> but there's a, there's, you know, that's a very good candidate for potential alien life, because it might be like the black smoke, as you see at the bottom of the sea, but we don't know, so haven't been there yet. But there are ice volcanoes, which is crazy. It's just instead of lava, you have water. <laughs> it's pretty cool. And someone's figured out that these rings that they're cleaning, it's a little bit like a snare drum. See this, this like wobbly spring bit at the bottom of the drum? Scientists have worked out that the rings of Saturn wobble when something inside Saturn changes because the gravity of the mass moving around pulls at the rings. So now there's a whole field of science where people actually study the wobble of the rings to work out what's going on inside Saturn, which is crazy. I mean, it's basically like, you know, Saturn is the, is the solar system's largest instrument. It's very, very cool. Um, and now this is Venus. Now, P Venus gets a bad rep because, to be fair, if you went onto Venus, you'd be simultaneously crushed and melted, <laughs> like instantly. Oh, and you'd, you'd dissolve as well. I forgot about that. It would be grim. Uh, that's, it's very hard to send missions there for this reason. But maybe we should, because these weird pancake-looking things, they're pancake volcanoes. The pressure of the surface is so extreme that it, volcanoes can't really form mountains properly, and they can't erupt lava properly, so it just comes out in a pancake shape. So pancake volcanoes, but don't eat them. <laughs> That's a bad idea. Do not eat the pancake, uh, the lava pancakes. They will, they will do you uh, a naughty. Um, we also have, um, now obviously this is not a planet. It's someone throwing molten iron at a wall because they had a bad day or something. Um, but there is uh, an asteroid called Psyche, which is a great name for an asteroid, and people think it's the smashed up remains of a planet that once was you know, trying to be a Mars or an Earth or something, and asteroids were like, nope, and just beat it up, and all you've got left is this iron core. And that iron core still was a little bit hot though, so it erupted liquid iron. So there are iron volcanoes out there, and now there's a mission that NASA's sending to this asteroid to actually try and find them, which is very cool. So basically a volcano is anything where, can you melt it and erupt it? It's a volcano. Um, <laughs> so maybe you can make your own. And oh, there's a moon called Titan. Some of you might have heard this one. It's a really, really strange moon because instead of water, you've actually got methane and ethane raining down on the surface. You've got methane and ethane lakes. You've got methane and ethane mountains. It's very, very weird. It's the only moon with an atmosphere zipping around Saturn. And my favorite thing about it is that the air, the atmosphere is so thick and the gravity is so low that if you flapped your arms, sneezed or farted, you could fly. <laughs> Which <laughs> I think we've all dreamed of that. <laughs> and in fact, the, 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 the atmosphere is so easy to fly through that we're actually sending a nuclear-powered drone to the surface to just hop about and have a look. I think it's really cool. It's one of the riskiest missions that could have been picked, but this is what it would do. We'll have a drone flying around Titan, um, thanks to its, you know, flight-capable atmosphere. Now, I think that's just really cool. Uh, and then we've got Mars. Now, obviously, if you think this is what Mars looks like now, then I'm worried. But <laughs> once upon a time, it's thought that there was possibly a massive ocean on Mars, which, as you can imagine, has some interesting implications for life. Um, the reason we might think that that's true is because, obviously, there's no big surface water there now, but there is a, this kind of crater. And on what we think is a shoreline, it's really like, mangled and chewed up. And we think, essentially, that it, it, this is like the asteroid impact that kind of killed the dinosaurs. We don't know if there was anything on Mars, but it still, something still slammed into Mars at some point and probably caused a mega tsunami that covered an entire hemisphere. Weirdly, the climate models say there was no way there was water at that point on Mars. It was just too cold. The atmosphere is gone. So actually, scientists have no idea which is right. Was there a giant ocean or wasn't there a giant ocean? But it's kind of cool that there might be. And we still hope that there is water on Mars. There's probably water beneath the surface. But mi recently, there was, at midnight, <laughs> there were these strange magnetic pings that happened, like a clock going off. Um, Mars has many robots on it. There's one called the InSight Lander, which is very, very cool. It's trying to understand how Mars got there, essentially. And it's got a magnetometer on it. And it's detected these strange pulses. and. No one actually can work out what these pulses are, but naturally when I wrote about this, everyone else, you know, the tabloids were like, aliens, it's aliens, it has to be aliens. Probably not aliens. Um, it's probably something just similarly cool, but not aliens. But these magnetic pulses may also indicate that there is a global layer of water beneath the surface, like, you know, sort of the water you get trapped in soil and things. If that's true, and there is a global subterranean sort of band of water on Mars, the implications are that it may be you know, Mars was 
um, life supporting at some point, and maybe it still is to some of the most extreme life forms. I mean, there's a life form on Earth that lives in a radioactive mine, and it just lives in complete darkness, and it kind of just lives off the decay of the rocks in this mine shaft. That's it. It doesn't need anything else. So, you know, one of the things that seems to be almost universal is the presence of water, almost. So maybe, maybe, but we have to, you know, send more robots there. And then we've got Pluto. Pluto is awesome. It's not a planet. Sorry, it isn't. <laughs> um, however, it looks amazing. And these images were taken by New Horizons, which has been flying out of the solar system for a while now. And Pluto has a heart on it, <laughs> which I think is just lovely, really. Um, you know, maybe it was like, hey, guys, hey, nice to... Oh, you're gone. Okay, <laughs> that's it for now. But this heart is weirdly radioactive, they think. It's a radioactive heart, which, by the way, if you have one of those, go to see a doctor. <laughs> Bad. Um, but Pluto has a radioactive heart because it's too small to have any heat trapped in it still from like its birth. And it must be, you know, the radioactive decay of elements must be fueling something in there, some heat source. And it, we know that uh, there is heat because it's, it appears to be moving icebergs of liquid nitrogen around. So no one really knows quite how that works either. But the fact that Pluto has a radioactive heart is kind of delightful, I think. Some of you probably noticed I kind of jumped over a few planets. Neptune being one of them, and George is the other one. Oh, not <laughs> George. <laughs> yes, George. Um, there was a planet called George in the solar system. It was discovered a while ago, um, and uh, it's, this, it's this ice giant, and the person that discovered it in 1781 was, I know, I'm going to name it after King George III. You'll love that. That's great. And people said, don't be silly. You can't call a planet George. We're calling it Uranus. <laughs> <laughs> Much to the delight of school children and humans everywhere, really. Um, yeah, <laughs> laughing at Uranus. Don't be so childish, honestly. <laughs> By the way, it does smell of farts. <laughs> does smell of farts. The chemical compositions on Uranus, if you could breathe them, which I wouldn't recommend. Farts, um, <laughs> literally perfect. <sighs> so Saturn is my favorite planet. But if you look kind of past it, you kind of see planets nearer, and you can get to see us. That's us. That's kind of cool, isn't it? You can see Earth um, from Saturn. This was taken by the late great Cassini probe that uh, intentionally crashed into Saturn at the end of its mission. It, do it dove through the rings multiple times and actually managed to weigh the entire rings of Saturn. That's really cool. But it also took a few pictures of us to make us feel very tiny and insignificant. Um, and, uh, you know, it's not just about Earth. There is the moon, and the moon is amazing because there are earthquakes on the moon which is strange, <laughs> but we call them moonquakes, obviously, because it would be silly. And these moonquakes are quite powerful, actually. So the Apollo astronauts, when they first landed, they put seismometers on the moon, which 10 years later, some idiots switched off remotely. It's really a waste. But these seismometers picked up on all kinds of quakes, and to have quakes, something must be happening inside the moon. But the moon just looks like a dead, sort of pale orb, so that was kind of strange. And scientists for decades were like, how are they getting... How are you getting quakes on the moon? And the really shallow ones are quite powerful. They're powerful enough that if, hopefully, eventually we have like, bases on the moon, it would destroy these bases. So we actually have to deal with quakes on the moon, which is kind of crazy. But these quakes are being caused by us. It's our fault. <laughs> the Earth's gravity, essentially, is tugging at the, at the moon. And it's kind of pulling these old faults apart. So it's kind of our fault, really, as usual. We're ruining not just Earth, but the moon. <laughs> mean, really. Um, and yeah, so the moon is actually kind of geologically alive, which I think is pretty cool. It looks like it's just there forever, but actually it's alive. We don't actually know how it got there, though. It's kind of confusing. <laughs> you think something's so close, we'd be like, yeah, we know how that got there. The general idea is that something the size of Mars was a bit of a dick, and it crashed into Earth, basically, when it was forming, and sent this glob of magma just flying into space. And the moon kind of coalesced from the debris outside, and they're still debating, is that true? Is that not true? We really don't really know at this point. We need to go to the moon and get more samples than just the handful around the Apollo landing sites. And uh, even though this is kind of a good model, it is kind of unclear how the moon got there. And it's, it's a, if we could access that story, if we worked out how the moon got there, we could understand more about how Earth got here, because the moon is made of mostly Earth stuff, we think. So it's like a library that's kind of buried. And if we could kind of dig up these secrets, we'd actually work out all these mysteries, which would be lovely. So I'm all for more missions to the moon. Um, and all, you know, the, the moon is also a good reminder that the universe kind of tries to get us every now and then. So during a recent blood moon super bollocks eclipse, or whatever they're called, they don't mean anything, by the way, something hit the moon, <laughs> which was really cool. It's very rare something we see it hit during a 
during an, a lunar eclipse, and it's very, 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 very tiny. It's like meow, that little dot, that little dot there. This little tiny, it turns out it was something moving at 27,000 miles an hour, and it was probably the shard of a comet that just decided to smack into the moon, it's having, obviously having a bad day. Um, and it's just a reminder that things are just flying about everywhere, and every now and then something hits something. This was really tiny, it was the size of a car. If it came to Earth, it would burn up in the atmosphere, so we're good. But it's kind of a nice reminder that the, <laughs> the moon is basically a little like mini shield from these sort of things. And sanding from the moon, you know, you look at what I think is the weirdest planet in the solar system, which is Earth. And there was a, uh, an astronaut called Edgar Mitchell, who did go a bit mad later in his life and believed in psychic healing and crazy stuff. But he, did, he has my favorite astronaut quote ever. And he said, you know, standing there, we develop an instant global consciousness, a people orientation, an intense dissatisfaction with the state of the world and a compulsion to do something about it. From out there on the moon, international politics look so petty. You want to grab a politician by the scruff of the neck, drag him a quarter of a million miles away and say, look at that, you son of a bitch. <laughs> Inspired, really. And it is amazing. A lot of the most amazing things come from people, I think. So people might have heard of the Nazca lines, these big kind of, uh, formations that you can see from really high up the animals and things. They're actually giant versions of these sort of things in the Middle East, actually. And no one knows how they got there, <laughs> which is kind of cool. Not aliens, not aliens. Um, but the Bedouin who continuously wander through this region just call them the works of the old men. Um, it's kind of thought maybe that these kites, which were first spotted from the air by British spies between the Second World War and the First, may have been used to trap animals, but we're not sure. And there are these just giant things radiating out from the Middle East that no one has any idea how they got there, which I think is kind of cool. And then you have your more gruesome mysteries. So Himalayas, very beautiful, obviously. There's this lake here. It's called Skeleton Lake, which is like, mm, you know, if you're plotting a route up to, you know, Everest, you might, you might avoid that. It sounds bad somehow. And it is bad because once a year in the summer, uh, lots of bones appear out of it. Some of them are still human flesh attached. It's pretty gruesome, actually. Skeleton Lake, very appropriate. And you think there were like hundreds of bodies here, and people, you think, like, we'd know how they got there, surely. Like, someone would notice, like, where are you going? Oh, just to a lake, <laughs> bringing all my friends. <laughs> but no one, no one sent a text or wrote anything about it. There's no re written records. And scientists thought, okay, we're gonna work out how they died, and they looked at these skeletons and like, no disease. <laughs> they don't seem to be injured in any way. There are a few fractures, but it's hard to tell what they were. And then scientists went back and went, right, we need to know how old these skeletons are. They all must have got there at the same time, right? Turns out they've been getting there for a thousand years. <laughs> and again, no one has noticed, <laughs> which is extraordinary. So some, like, it looks like people came from the Mediterranean, possibly. Some came from, like, where now is India. Some came from China. And no relation to it, anyone whatsoever. It's a complete mystery. No one knows. But Earth is full of these wonderful, gruesome things. And someone made some art for an article I wrote once, which is just fantastically gruesome. Um, also, we have lava tornadoes. Now, <laughs> that sounds like witchcraft to me. But during last year's eruption at Kilauea, Hawaii, there were these volcanoes. There was this volcano. Um, it, just, it just kept erupting, basically. Amazingly, no one died, and it produced loads of lava. But then scientists noticed, like, what the hell is this lava doing? It seems really angry, and it's just a lava flow. And you can see that the wind is actually trying to spin it around and make it into a tornado. Now, I know lava's been in movies, and it's obviously very hot, but if you touch it, it won't just burn you. If it's flying out like that, it's like being hit by a cannonball. It's just 1,000 degrees Celsius. It's quite bad. <laughs> you don't want to get hit by one of these. Someone actually did get hit by one of these. Uh, during the eruption, and because they refused to evacuate, which is dumb, obviously, and it, a, a, a sort of lava bomb flew out of this and went straight through their leg uh, and sort of broke it, but it was kind enough to cauterize the wound as it did so, because it was so hot. So that's nice, isn't it? <laughs> and also, we had, like, lava sometimes makes blue fire. That's pretty weird. That's pretty strange. Um, it turns out that it kind of cooks the vegetation beneath it sometimes, and it kind of releases the methane and sort of burns the natural gas which looks really cool, but then the ground suddenly explodes, which is, again, bad. Um, <laughs> you do want to stay away from these things. But that, to me, is witchcraft, really. I thought that was just made up when I first saw it. But it's not. It's amazing. And science is like drones. Everyone likes drones now. So science wanted to know what was happening at the crater of this volcano called Kilauea, because the lava was coming out of the side of it. So they sent drones over, and it turns out that the ground at was At the kind of summit of Kilauea itself. Volcano, an unmanned aircraft systems team recently circumnavigated the crater rim, which is now seven times larger than it was before the eruption began.
plan. The data collected by the overflight will be used for digital elevation models that document summit changes. Obviously that road is now pointless. <laughs> Unless you're feeling dangerous. No one fell in. Kind of amazing, I would. I'm really clumsy. Dropped my phone into a volcano once, but I got it back out. <laughs> From early May 2018 to the present, the volume change at the summit is over 825 million cubic meters, or 1 billion cubic yards. The vertical collapse of the crater floor is more than 1,600 feet. Not a good place to bury evidence, though, because it stopped erupting. It literally ate the land around it. The Hawaiian Volcano Observatory published this time-lapse video showing the progression of the summit changes from April 14th to August 20th. No, no, no. That's what I was saying. I speak volcano. So yeah, kind of dangerous to stand around these things sometimes. But again, no one died. Kind of amazing. No one got drunk and went there. Actually, in Hawaii, they have to issue a warning every time there's an eruption to not roast marshmallows on the lava. They actually have to issue this warning because people obviously go, oh, and then trip in and get a bit of a sort of shave they weren't expecting. And now water's turning up in the lake. And that sounds very nice, but if the water fills up to a certain point, magma will return and then it will just blow up the lake, which is not as, you know, that's not what lakes are advertised as being, but it's suddenly aggressive. Um, and also, volcanoes make smoke rings. Now, this doesn't matter where you are. Volcanoes actually make smoke rings. And scientists were like, this doesn't really have any scientific importance, but we really want to know how this happened. And they were like, how do we work it? And they used these complex computer models, and they're like, oh, I don't know. And then someone's like, kind of looks like those smoke gun things. And it turns out it's exactly the same. It's really cool. Volcanoes, just with a certain kind of vent at the top, just puff out smoke every now and then. Well, not smoke, it's more like, condensed gas, and if a volcanologist heard me saying smoke, they would shoot me. But um, yeah, it's basically like this. That's all it is. Volcanoes can do this amazingly cool party trick, uh, and uh, it's that simple. <laughs> After all these complex models, it's like, oh, toy solved it. That's cool. Um, also, you've got this. Now, that looks disgusting, and it is. Um, it's, <laughs> it's an eruption uh, um, taking place in uh, Tanzania which I always see as Tanzania in my head, but Tanzania. Um, and that's where Africa is slowly breaking apart in three different pieces. And in 20 million years, there would be an ocean there. But until there is, it's supplying us with crazy as hell volcanoes. Like this one, called Oldoinio Lengo, which means the mountain of God. This lava, which is lava, is as fluid as water, and it's 500 degrees Celsius. So it's too cold to be red. It's just black. And amazingly, I think this is the only place where someone has fallen into lava and survived. Yes, they got really badly burned. Don't do it, not a good party trick. But they survived, like falling into lava and surviving. No volcano in space is that weird. That is very strange. And it does look disgusting, though. And then you've got volcanoes like this. Now, if you're ever lucky to go and see a volcano, especially with Americans, who react very, very Americanly to the noise that volcanoes make. <laughs> this is in Papua New Guinea. And every now and then, a little bit of gas gets trapped in a volcano. You know, you've got indigestion, and then, you know, like sometimes you burp, but a bit sick comes up? It's gross, but that's basically what happens here. See the shock wave in the clouds. Watch out for the shock, it's coming. It is. <laughs> and here comes the... Holy smoking Toledo's. <laughs> Isn't that adorable? <laughs> Well done for not swearing, jeez, it's amazing. Um, that one's heard of Vesuvius, everyone knows that famous eruption that poor uh, people in Pompeii kind of got smothered by and in Herculaneum. It actually last erupted in 1944 and destroyed more allied aircraft than any, any attack by like, you know, the Nazis, which is quite inconvenient, because originally the Allies were thinking of bombing Vesuvius to set it off to bury the Nazi aircraft, and then they got rid of them, they put their aircraft there, and Vesuvius is like, I'm having you, and then just erupted. Um, and it is, you know, that's just very rude, really. Um, there's also a really strange debate as to how the people in Pompeii died. It's quite gruesome. There is a genuine debate as to whether, oh, did their skin just explode? Mm, not sure. Did they suffocate? Oh, I don't know. Oh, I think their heads exploded, said one recently. And there, he's, he got into a fierce argument with people who deal with cremations to be like, no, their heads don't explode, don't be silly. And he's like, but how does their head explode from the inside? And it's a really 
there's, that debate is still going on. No one is actually sure it, actually what killed them. Did they asphyxiate? Did they burn alive? But it's either way, bad day. <laughs> bad day in Pompeii. Um, but that is the debate that's actually happening. I can write about earthquakes sometimes too. Now, earthquakes are cool. Apart from the, all the death and stuff, that's bad. But earthquakes scientifically are amazing. Because you think of an earthquake like, you know, something hits something underground, it shakes, and understandably that's an earthquake. Some earthquakes don't make any noise at all. And there was an earthquake that lasted 50 days and no one felt it. Now, it wasn't like some, everyone got really drunk and just woke up and was like, God, what did we do? But there's an earthquake that lasted 50 days in Turkey and no one felt it because it just slowly crept along. Sneaky, sneaky. It just slunk, slunk along. No one noticed it. And I thought, that's extraordinary. It's like a phantom quake, someone said. And someone went, ah, ha, ha, hold my beer. There's an earthquake that lasted for nine years and no one felt it. It's like, what? There's a nine years near Washington State. The only reason they knew that there was an earthquake there was because once they put these seismometers out and they're like, oh, I guess the ground shakes a bit, nine years later, it stopped and they went, that was a fucking earthquake. <laughs> <laughs> kind of funny. Um, it might have been going on for longer, but no one knows. But it was, these are called slow slip events and they're really poorly understood and they're very strange. They only seem to happen on Earth. Earth is pretty weird. Also, there are underwater eruptions and every now and then they belch out pumice which is kind of the stuff you exfoliate on or throw at people who don't know it's that, not that heavy and they just go, ah, and you're really horrible. This is a pumice raft seen from space. It erupted off the coast of Tonga, Kingdom of Tonga, uh, in the South uh, Pacific. And uh, this is about the size of San Francisco, this, this pumice uh, raft. And initially, a volcano had erupted there and they went, ah, well, it only erupted once. We don't know what to call it, though. What, what do you want to call it? And no one, someone forgot to give it a name, so it's just listed as unnamed which is kind of mean. But now it's erupted twice, they're like, maybe we should give it a name. <laughs> uh, and the best thing about it is the person who gets to decide what it's called is the King of Tonga, which is not a sentence that you normally hear. Um, I can't wait to see that naming ceremony. But yeah, boats went through it and you got people looking absolutely befuzzled, <laughs> like giant pumice rocks, which by the way, smelled of farts. Um, good tip by the way, often like sulfurous gases come out when an eruption, when magma is quite shallow which might mean an eruption, it might not, but basically, don't visit a volcano of a friend who's quite farty, because you may not know if it's them or the volcano, and that's awkward either way, really. Um, and also, you know, volcanic eruptions are up on seismometers on Earth. They are absolutely monstrously loud, um, and there was a strange rumble uh, last year which echoed around the planet and sounded like a big boom, but it wasn't an earthquake, it wasn't a meteor, it wasn't aliens, um, but it had this weird tick to it, and scientists spent months looking through the results. Turns out it was an eruption so large, <laughs> and it's birthing its own volcano, that if it happened here, it would cover the entirety of Bulgaria. So, you know, lovely that it happened underwater. So lovely of it, very polite. Um, and in school as well, you're taught, oh, volcanoes, you know, whether they're on Earth or in space, they have magma chambers, these like capsules of molten doom. And it turns out scientists have never seen one. <laughs> we don't even know if they're real. That's kind of a weird thing to say. But we've never imaged a magma chamber. It's obvious there's something molten coming up and there are ideas about what that might be, but no one's actually imaged a magma chamber. In fact, magma chamber isn't even used anymore. It's magma reservoir, because apparently that sounds fancier. Um, but there is an effort right now by scientists to go to an underwater volcano, kind of set off small explosions around it, send seismic waves into it, and bounce back. And they're just going to keep orbiting, keep orbiting it in a boat, and build up a 3D image of a magma chamber for the first time. And it's kind of extraordinary that you know, we know so much about the Earth, we know so much about space, but we don't actually know what's in the heart of a volcano, um, apart from rage, obviously. <laughs> They're very angry things. And here's another thing you're not taught at schools, really. There are giant mega crystal caves underneath the ground, which, again, sound kind of made up, but they're extraordinary. I mean, I'm, I'm really clumsy. If I was this person, I would slip and sit on one of these spikes, unfortunately, I think. But this is in Spain. You can go see this. You can actually go see it. It's in an abandoned silver mine. It's called the Pulpi Geode. And it took millions of years to form. It's just like a weird, slow cooking recipe to get these giant crystals. But then Mexico is like, <laughs> pathetic. Oh, I'll show you crystals. And then <laughs> just grew these giant ones here. Um, they're made of gypsum, which is what chalk is made of. Don't know why they called it chalk. Um, and they basically just form very, very slowly. They're very, it's like a drip kind of recipe where you need to keep the temperature a kind of constant tick, you need a constant supply of materials. 
It takes millions of years, you know, but these things are real. They exist on Earth, and you can see them. <laughs> I cannot believe that these images aren't shown to people more, you know, rather than just, oh, you know, other planets. Other planets in the solar system are great, but they don't have this, probably. So, you know, we can actually go see this. So Earth is still the weirdest planet. And again, it matters showing off this kind of cool stuff to everyone, because otherwise, people will continue to Google really weird things, like, do rocks have feelings? <laughs> yes, they get really annoyed when you Google, do rocks have feelings? <sighs> is lava real? <laughs> no. <laughs> yes, it is. It's very real. It's, uh, it makes its attention, it makes its presence known. And then, what does lava taste like? <laughs> I feel like the people Googling that question should just go ahead and find out. <laughs> Tastes like death. <laughs> it's grim. And eggs. Ugh. Grim last meal. And, you know, it matters because whether we're talking about Earth or space, you know, everything is connected, actually. And there is a mission right now in Antarctica, and they're trying to find a buried secret, essentially. There are lots of meteorites found all over the world, but Antarctica is particularly good because it's basically a desert. You know, it's a cold desert, but it's a desert. And meteorites stand out from the whiteness there. And uh, scientists notice there's a lot of stony ones, but there should be a lot of iron ones too, which is like the insides of planets, but they couldn't find any, really. They have a massive deficit. So scientists are like, okay, how do we work this out? So they basically got a block of ice, got a lamp, put an iron meter out on it and just shone the lamp on it, and the iron heated up just enough to sink beneath the ice, just hide below the surface. And they're like, God, they're all hiding beneath the surface. So like, how are we going to find them? So they, someone went, I know, let's get snowmobiles and put metal detectors and just drive around trying to find them, and that's actually what they're trying to do. And if they find them, they're finding the hearts of dead planets in Antarctica. I cannot think of a cooler job than that. That's amazing. And if we find these and we understand how those planets sit and form, we better understand how the ones in our solar system formed. It's all part of a big ongoing quest, and it's awesome, whether you're studying Earth or space. And in the, at the end of the day, it's good to remember that even with all this cool stuff that we know, it's really nothing compared to the universe. So this is uh, an interstellar comet. Um, it's actually just popped into the solar system to say hi. And actually, from initial analysis, it looks just like the comets that we have, which suggests that, that you know, the solar systems elsewhere aren't that different from our own. And we just haven't really been able to see many of them yet. And it's, you know, we live on this, like, tiny spot where we've got a very limited view, and there's so much still to see. In fact, there's a quote by a better doctor than me, Doctor Who, actually, who said that this is one corner of one country in one continent on one planet that's a corner of a galaxy, that's a corner of a universe that is forever growing and shrinking, creating and destroying, and never remaining the same for a single second. And there is so much, so much to see, and there really is. And if I've had one objective today, it's to show you that actually our solar system isn't just a bunch of, like, planets you just learn about at school, but it is a freak show, and the weirdest planet of all is Earth. And if every now and then you have a moment to appreciate that, we can stop people Googling those stupid questions. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>